focus groups and as task groups. And I ask you to get involved, whether it's your first meeting or your 18th like mine. I just had enough fingers and toes for Deb yesterday. Um, but Padwig operates because of you and all of us working together. It's been running for close on 40 years there and we continue to work and make progress and evolve because of all of us here. Um, our first two talks today are video talks. The first by Hung Sui. Uh, she's a computer and information scientist and a professor at the School of Information in the University of Arizona. The research focuses on machine learning applications for semantic annotation of semi-structured information with a current focus on biodiversity literature. Unfortunately, she can't be with us today online, but one of her co-authors, James Macklin, is in the audience who can answer some questions. We're ready to go. morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Hong Tsui. I'm a professor with School of Information at the University of Arizona. Today, I'm presenting preliminary findings of usability studies on character recorder, which is ontology-enhanced taxon by character matrix editor. We reported the making of the tools in 2021 meeting. And now we report how useful the tool is to biology students and taxonomists. The issue we're facing is that published phenotypic information is not fair for human or computer agents. This includes the taxonomic and morphological descriptions in floras and faunas, taxonomic revisions, and taxon by character matrices used in evolutionary studies. Currently, we rely on post-publication curation or AI to convert published information to a semantic format. Neither solution solves the problem. Professional curation is not scalable and it's burdened with intercurator variation, often as high as 40%. Post-publication also curation faces the issue of low response rate and a lack of support for authors. Author curation often just to serve as the tri tri triage step for professional curation. Although AI has gained a lot of attention in recent times, we know that on sense disambiguation tasks, AI will never outperform human experts. If intercurator variation is at 40%, then AI's performance cannot succeed, exceed 60%. We proposed to create and evaluate an author-driven, ontology-enhanced taxon by character matrix platform to study the feasibility of this approach, where authors use and build ontologies um, while recording their characters, and the system outperforms taxonomic descriptions and RDF graphs at the same time. We used CARAX as the case study in this project. We have described character recorder in detail in 2021 meeting. And here I will just highlight a few key features. To start, the users are encouraged to use the recommended set of characters, although they can also create new characters. When they create new characters, they need to define the character and the added, add needed terms to the ontology. After the user created empty matrix with selected characters, they enter values to the matrix. They can reuse the values other users used for this specific character and taxon, or they can select terms from ontology. In this example, the user entered an alternative spelling of deceptos without an A, and the system informed the user that the term in the ontology contains the A. While the system gives Recommended terms, it also allows the user to define and add terms they need to the ontology on the fly, and they can use the added terms right away. Character recorder can fetch illustrations from the backend ontology for different character terms. 
For some selected colors, Factor Recorder has a color palette so that users can select colors as opposed to color names for the matrix. Even when color palettes are available, users are free to not use them and use color names. In the usability studies, we want to see how often users use color palettes. We conducted two separate usability studies on Character Recorder, one with 16 undergraduate biology students who just finished a CAREX identification class. They completed a one-hour controlled experiment, recorded 11 given characters. In the CAREX expert evaluation group, we had eight character experts ranged from graduate student to retirees, all have published some taxonomic um, description on CAREX. They completed a three-day real-life work, work sessions in a biology lab. They recorded all characters of CAREX um, condensants and CAREX rostrata using mounted specimen. The results suggest all participants learn to use a character recorder quickly, and the vast majority of them will not need a tutorial to use the tool in the next time. It took significantly longer for students to complete the task using character recorder than using Excel. However, using character recorder reduced the number of unique words used by three folds. Vast majority of the students prefer character recorder to learn characters and to record CAREX characters. Further, all students agree that taking part in the study raised their awareness of data variation issues. All experts, on the other hand, would recommend character recorder to their colleagues, and they all agreed that such a tool should be in every taxonomist's toolbox. Additionally, although most experts liked the feature of reusing others' character values, one expert did not, because it may undermine the objectiveness and uh, independence of an author. All experts used a recommended set of characters, and two experts also added a good number of new characters. 84% of character values were recorded using color palettes when they are available for a relevant color. This suggests that the authors prefer to use color palettes over color name strings. Um, in addition, all experts lack the term suggestion and illustration features. This screen shows when color palettes are used, it is easy to see the color variation in color of she's character in one taxa. The key question we asked was if character recorder would incur significantly higher cognitive efforts as compared to Excel. The answer is no. This screen shows students and experts' responses to NASA task, task load index questionnaire. This is a widely used instrument to, to assess cognitive load of tasks. This questionnaire asked about mental demand of task, performance of the participants in recording high quality data, effort of the participant, that is how hard they had to work, and the frustration of the participants while completing the task. So basically, performance is our value measure, and the three other dimensions are our cost measure. Here, yellow indicates character recorder scored lower than Excel. Green color indicates characters recorder record scored higher than Excel for a dimension. Now we can see from the yellow-green distribution, the results from students and expert experiments were similar. We can also see performance shows a different pattern than the other three dimensions. So let's look at performance dimension. We see 66% of students thought character recorder was weaker than Excel in recording high quality data. Another 6% thought they were the same. But the rest of the 88% of students thought a character recorder gave them stronger support in recording higher quality data. Experts' finding is similar. Um, on the three cost dimensions, we see yellow and green are roughly balanced, suggesting compared to Excel, character recorder did not impose excessively more cognitive load 
as perceived by the users. Recall, overall students were significantly slower using Character Recorder to complete the task than using Excel, but their overall frustration and efforts were not very different between Character Recorder and Excel. This suggests that while students were slow, they were not struggling during the task. In conclusion, our early survey showed that 85% of the authors are eager to adopt ontology-enhanced authoring workflow to produce fair data. Now we show that an ontology-enhanced matrix editor can be made easy to use with equal perceived efforts as using Excel that can produce higher quality data. In the future, we would like to test the tool with other cases and we welcome collaborations with publishers to integrate this idea into authors' publishing workflow. With that, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Apologize for it because the sound and the, the voice and the slides were out of sync. Now we're looking at the possibility of running through the slides separately, or we can move on and, and discuss this later. You want to play it again then? Okay. We have the slides here. Somebody's got a particular question on what was asked. So have we got any online questions? Not yet. Anybody in the audience got questions for James? So, good Lord. Um, what we can do is put a link to the slides in the Slack channel, and then you could go and have a look if you're interested. That sounds good. If there's no questions, we might move on to the uh, next talk. And in the meantime, we'll try and load the slides up into Slack, because at the end of this session, we have a time for discussion, and then we can go back to that if people wish. A second speaker also unfortunately can't be with us today, Lee Belbin. Lee. Um, is a coordinator of the Padwick Task Group on Data Quality, Tests and Assertions. He's from Hobart, Tasmania, and is an environmental consultant that has been involved with Padwick for many, many years. He spent many years working with the Australian Antarctic Data Centre and later with the Atlas of Living Australia. And he's talking about um, the Data Quality, Tests and Assertions Task Group. This is a brief summary of the work that uh, Data Quality Task Group 2 has done over the last uh, 12 months. This group is looking at tests and assertions, and I want to thank my collaborators, Arthur Chapman, Paul Morris, and John Wachorik for the amazing work that they've put in on this project. So what is the goal of the group? to build a suite of core data quality or fitness for use tests and their assertions based upon Darwin core terms. A bit of a history. We started in 2017 with Arthur, John, Paul and I, plus Paul is a Moglio and Alex Thompson, and Paula and Alex uh, put in an amazing amount of work in the early part of the work of this group. I figure we've probably had around 100 Zoom meetings and sadly only one face-to-face, -face, largely thanks to COVID. The work is based upon Data Quality Task Group 1's Data Quality Framework. Uh, most of the terminology and strategy uh, aligns with that framework. And it's fair to say that our task group has probably extended the framework as well. We recognized early in the piece 
that uh, evaluating data quality or fitness for use is certainly limited by the lack of vocabularies. Hence, uh, Paula's uh, work to kick off task group four on vocabularies. We desperately need them if we are to better evaluate data quality. We thought it was going to be easy. I think at least I did, but five years later, we still 99% of the way there. What are some of the basics? All tests and assertions are record-based. That's not to say you can't aggregate the results across any data set that you want. You certainly can. And what about the concept of core tests? What are the criteria? They provide, the tests provide a useful evaluation or a potential enhancement of a record. We believe these tests are widely applicable to biodiversity data. Um, with the recognition that specialist domains can certainly easily build upon the specifications of the core tests as required. And we'd also say that they are reasonably easy to implement. And we're running into that now with Paul's work on the implementation of these tests. Current status, we do have 98 tests, um, all available in GitHub. That could be broken down at the top level and to 65 validations, three issues, 26 amendments, and five measures. And here's an example of one of the uh, simplest uh, tests. The specifications are pretty basic. Uh, a standardized label, an English description, and then a series of other specifications that relate to the framework. Probably the most complex is the expected response. And it's of course the area where we've probably put in most of the work because it's from this expected response that the implementation is made. If it is ambiguous, it will be ambiguous to implement. So we've put a lot of time and effort there. One other point here that I'd point out would be the fact that this test is parameterized. So taxon rank in this case, access as a vocabulary, and we've set a default there as the taxonomic rank GBIF vocabulary. We've also got some notes. Um, if they are required to elaborate something that may not be clear from the other specifications. In this case, we're saying this test will fail if there are trailing or leading blanks, um, white space or non-printing characters. We have generated uh, or used 80 terms uh, so far in the vocabulary for task group two. And we've provided those terms, definitions, the context that term is used in, and a comment if necessary about that term. Again, publicly available in GitHub. The other big thing we finished over the last while is 1,034 records uh, of test data. And again, it's publicly available on GitHub. And this will just give you a bit of an idea on what it looks like. We refer in here the specifications to the test itself, a unique uh, data uh, record identifier, the input data, the output data, what we expect is a response status, a response result, and again, comments about that particular record, what it is testing, what we expect the response to be. An example of the use of this test data on the implementation is that we have had to remove three tests because we've recognized that the geographic hierarchy is not as robust and as static as the names hierarchy. So these tests could not be implemented uh, in an unambiguous fashion. Uh, we could conceive of situations that where we'd break uh, what we thought were going to be the rules associated with these tests. So we've removed them and effectively replaced them with something that we think we can stand behind that would in fact produce unambiguous results. We're still 99% of the way there. 
what's left is to finalize the test data. And that is an area where um, I would really appreciate some help. Uh, I think we've got most of the edge cases done, but the tests themselves need to be, uh, the test data needs to be balanced out to make sure we're testing all scenarios for all tests. So it's an area where I really value some input. Paul has to complete the test implementation. That's um, very close to complete, if not complete as I speak. And finally, we need to transform the tests their specifications, the vocabulary, the test data, and the principles we've come up with into a Tadwick standard. And again, I'd just like to thank the work that Alex and Paul have put into this, and also want to thank uh, Deb and Alan for the comments they've made on a number of tests uh, more recently than that. The photograph here was taken when we had less gray hair in Gainesville in our one uh, and only face-to-face -face meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as you saw, I was a co-author on this, so I can answer any questions as Lee is somewhere in the field at the moment. Uh, have we got any online questions? Right, we have a question from David Shorthouse. Lee, are there any computational gotchas with any test assertions, i.e. can they be executed in near real time with harvesting of dark Darwin core archive data sets by GBIF, for example? That's a good question, David. Um, we're hoping that all the tests can be implemented. Now, originally these were set up for GBIF, the Atlas of Living Australia, and I dig bio, the aggregators, to test these, run these tests against their system. But what we'd like to do is get these tests run earlier, before the data is ever sent to the aggregators. And so what we've tried to do with the tests and the uh, test data set is set it up so that anybody can implement this on their data set, on their uh, platform and run the tests on their platform against the test data set and see if it produces the same answer. Now they might not, might not want to implement all 98 tests, they might only want to implement some. So a lot of these tests um, will work quite easily, a lot rely on vocabularies and trying to set up the vocabularies is difficult. And some are parameterized, which means that you can set um, the vocabulary that you use separate from the default. For example, if we're working in Australia, we might set the um, elevation to a much lower level than what you would for the world. Or you might want to use the Australian Plant Names Index data set rather than GBIS Global uh, data set. So that's the parameterization. We don't know how that's going to work in practice, but we think it will if we've got the, the processes and the, and the vocabularies available. So there are gotcha moments and some of these tests will be very easy. Uh, Nikki Nicholson says, has there been any work to use GitHub continuous integration to run the test implementations to test before arrival at aggregators? Uh, not through the GitHub, but we're hoping that the museums and herbaria could implement it on their own platforms, their own data sets. And um, we're hopefully been talking to places like Specify and KEMU that we can try and get some of these tests built into their systems, but that's still a way off. Got one question in the audience and that, that time is it? One quick question. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, in, in my talk, which will be in a bit, we're also thinking uh, about DISCO, uh, which will probably situate between the local CMSs and the data aggregators. And we think it's a very nice place to implement these tests as well. So yeah, we're starting with 
with implementing them there as well. Yeah. And for those of you who are interested in the money in the bottom line, it saves money and staff time. Yes, we're hoping that will all be implemented uh, fairly fast. Now, somehow I've got to find where John's talking. I'll introduce John. Our next speaker is live, John Waller, um, from the uh, GBIF node, has been uh, an analyst at GBIF since 2018 and is the maintainer of the RGBIFR package. Yes, okay, I believe my mic is on. Uh, yeah, so I'll be talking about the GBIF backbone today. So what is the GBIF backbone? So the GBIF backbone, you can think about as being a giant checklist data set. Uh, it's mostly composed of the catalog of life, but there are some other checklists that we add to sort of plug holes and make it a little bit more complete. And you can sort of see this animation sort of give you a little intuition about how it's built and uh, what it's about. Um, so why go through this process? It's kind of actually sort of difficult to do this, and there's a lot of code behind it and a lot of thinking about how to assemble it in the right way. But why go through all this trouble to build this gigantic, big backbone taxonomy at GPIF? Uh, well, mostly we do this in order to organize occurrence data. So we have here three publishers and a, a fourth one who come to us and they say, hey, I have this name. Uh, can you make this work for me somehow like us uh, so each of these come with a collector splendens and they have some variation so what we would like to do is just simply normalize all that into one accepted name which we believe is the accepted name that the occurrence publishers meant to have uh of course thinking about this sort of ignores a lot of the complexity of taxonomy but this is very useful for users who come to gbif and want to just look for the species that they're interested in um, of course, sometimes publishers will come to us with incomplete data, like this fourth publisher who comes to us and says, okay, I have just Coleopteryx species. In that case, we'll throw a data quality flag on that occurrence and say, hey, we can't match this to anything but genus. Uh, and that's something that we have to do for this case because they just gave us a genus. Uh, so the GBIF data backbone, GBIF, uh, Backbone is basically exists just to organize occurrence data. That's why it exists, and that's why we build it. Um, so there can be several reasons why a name does not match to the GBIF backbone. Of course, at GBIF, we would want as much data, occurrence data as possible to be linked up to a name in the backbone as possible. This helps users, and it's uh, it just overall is, is much better for users and for publishers if their name is matched to something in the backbone. Uh, so of course we can just get names that are just sort of not matchable in a way. They're not really acceptable scientific names. Sometimes people give us a name like mystery, mystery, or sonus naturalis. So it's like a natural sound or just incomplete names. So this is something that's not really the backbone's fault or Jeebus fault, or not even necessarily the publisher's fault. Maybe they're just reading a label. But we can't, this is not something we're interested in. So if this doesn't match the backbone, we're not concerned. So it's, we wouldn't consider this a data gap. Uh, also, there's a hybrid. Uh, this is something that we do have in the backbone, but checklist publishers are not really great about publishing hybrid names, a little bit more complex. So if we found a hybrid name and it doesn't match the GBIF backbone, we're not as concerned. It's not a big priority. So we're not, this is another where it's like, okay, it didn't match, but. That's not really our fault or the publisher's fault. It's just a complex name. Uh, and then sometimes they just give us below species. So they will just give us a name that's a subspecies or some variety or something. And those tend to have less representation in the backbone as well, just because checklist publishers maybe necessarily don't put that in. Uh, we, of course, would like to have the subspecies in the backbone. But again, it's sort of, it's not as big a deal as if we didn't have the, the, the species level name. Um, okay, and then there's sort of this more complex 
reason why something might not match to the backbone is a uh, too many choices, I call it. Well, in this case, a publisher might, uh, occurrence publisher might give us just the binomial name. And then when they come to GBIF and our name matcher tries to match it to the backbone, it will come and it'll try to find uh, the name. But if we have uh, two names with the same binomial, but with different authorship, we won't be able to say which one that is. And that way it will only match to the genus name. So that's another one where it's kind of, we need to maybe go back to publishers and say, hey, you need to give us more information. But this is another one where it's not really the backbone's fault. So it's not really the completeness of the backbone, which is causing the problem. Um, yeah, and then of course, these are the ones that I was looking for, basically were the names where we couldn't find a good reason why it didn't match to the GBIF backbone. We don't have a good explanation. Do we have a lot of these names that publishers are giving us where we can't match it to the backbone, where we say, oh, you gave us something, but we can't match it anywhere. That would be really nice if we could, because it's maybe it's a very important occurrence and someone later, a data user coming back and looking for that species wouldn't be able to find it. They'd just be able to find maybe the genus or family name. So that would be a data gap perhaps. And that'd be something that GBIF would be concerned about. Um, so these are all these reasons that I went over, uh, just plotted on a graph with uh, 11 sort of representative groups. I sort of chose these groups at random and maybe you can't read the label names, but uh, the top two are Coleoptera and Lepidoptera and then the rest are a bunch of uh, other like smaller groups. So the idea here is to show that just using name strings that the red shows that we might potentially have a lot of missing names, like sort of if we eliminate all these other reasons, the, we might have thousands of missing names in these groups that occurrence publishers are saying, hey, I have a name for you, but we say, oh, no, we can't match it to anything but genus or family or some higher rank, which is not great. Um, Yes, so are these red names potentially real data gaps? Are these something that are we missing? Do we need to take care of this problem? Uh, so there are reasons why a potentially missing name still might not be in the GBIF backbone, which uh, is still not sort of the backbone's fault or GBIF's fault. So it could be a misspelling or it could be an old combination, which is something that we still want in the backbone, but it's it's not as bad as if it were an accepted name that everyone's using in the in the literature and everything that we don't have in the backbone. That'd be much worse than having an old combination that's missing from the backbone. So it's very difficult to figure out if this is true, but I made some attempts. So that's what I'm gonna go over now. Uh, so this is the similar graph as before, um, and we can still see, and this time I limited it to binomials because uh, the previous graph was all just name strings, but now I'm just looking at binomials and we can still see that there's still perhaps thousands of missing species, even if we account perhaps for like misspellings and uh, maybe perhaps being an old combination. Um, so I still sort of don't believe this graph. I made this some weeks ago and I think that there, I don't think there are a lot of misspellings in the occurrence data we're getting, but I think that there are a lot of old combinations that I'm just not detecting with the way that I use to detect it. So I think based on just what we know about taxonom like taxonomy and how names are published, I would just guess that you, you would expect like at least half of these missing names to still be old combinations and they're just sort of missed by the way that I tried to find out that it was an old combination. But still, that's a lot of names, If you, especially if you look at Coleoptera and Lepidoptera. Uh, that's still quite a lot of names. Um, yeah, so here's a table of what I consider like the sort of potential like upper limits. So this is sort of a maximum of what could be the missing binomials in the GBIF backbone, which is, uh, so if you look at some of these groups like Coleoptera and Lepidoptera, that's, that's a huge amount of missing uh, names. So again, these are likely at least half, you can probably assume are these old combinations and things like that. And so I actually got uh, Donald to look at this, Donald Holborn, this is a Lepidoptera expert. I sent him the names and I said, hey, hey, what are these? What are, what are these something that you should be concerned about? And he was like, yeah, yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff in here. There's some that are missing and, you know, we're working on it. And 
there's but there's of course a lot of stuff that's just these old combinations which are really hard to deal with and and so yeah so i kind of put that this number you can say cut it in half cut it in like a by 70 percent or something but there's still thousands of names there that uh we should probably be concerned about getting into the backbone and i'm sort of a odonata expert and so i reviewed the odonata names and i can say that this isn't far off from what I think is actually missing from the GBIF backbone. So yeah, so I think you can sort of take these numbers with a grain of salt, but yeah, the idea that the GBIF backbone is perfect is sort of not true. There's there's lots of missing names and especially missing old combinations, which is still something we'd want to get in because when museums come to us, they say, hey, I have this name. It would be great if we were able to link it back up to some accepted name or two occurrences. Um, okay, so of course we're working on it. Uh, so since 2017, there have been hundreds of thousands of names added to Coleoptera in the, to the GVIF backbone. So it's of course a work in progress and all the checklist publishers and all the people at Catalog of Life and all the people who build the backbone, they're continuously working on this. And so, I mean, over time, there have been thousands of accepted names and synonyms added to the backbone. So it's a work in progress. And there are there's work to make this even better with the Catalog of Life Plus project where we'll be able to take parts of checklists and stick them together with the sort of checklist that Catalog of Life uses. So yeah, so to end on a positive note, uh, yeah, things are getting better. And there should be another backbone update coming somewhat soon. So uh, yeah. I would expect these numbers to go down somewhat, but it's still a huge task for these checklist publishers like Donald and all the people who work to like go through and look for all these old combinations and synonyms and names and keep up just with the new literature as well within these groups. So it's a very hard task and uh, yeah, but we're working on it um, and we hope that it keeps getting better. Yeah, so here's just a graph about the, the sort of improvements in names over time in the backbone. You can sort of see it flattens out towards the end, but that's just simply because we did some updates just to update uh, uh, one checklist, but it wasn't a, a big up backbone update. But you can see every time we update on the backbone, we add like thousands of names to the backbone. So things are constantly improving. And so we hope that that uh, continues. And uh, I think that's all my slides. Yeah, that's all my slides. But yeah, I just wanna thank, of course, all the people who work on the backbone, all the people at Catalog of Life who work on like, helping the backbone and uh, of course, uh, yes, everyone at GBIF who made this work possible. John, uh, there's a question, well, two questions, one from David Shorthouse, who says, are most of the unknowns coming from specimen-based occurrences or observations? And if you constrain the list to type specimens, would this be informative? Yeah, unmuted, yes, I'm unmuted. Uh, that's a great question. I don't think I can answer it. I don't remember if I had looked at the sort of basis of record origin of the missing names, but I think that would be a great thing to look at. Um, my intuition is that probably yes, they're coming from museum collections just based on that it would be old combinations and something from like a citizen science data set would be something that would already be in the backbone. Um, as far as the second question, I think I'll have to look into that further. I don't think I can answer that right now, but that's a very good question. Thank you, David, very much. Another question from Vijay Barr. Are these missing names publicly available so more taxonomy studies can take a look at them? uh i'm not sure if they but they will be yes yes uh, they're not sort of publicly available right now as like a zenodo data set or something like that but yeah it's a work in progress so i hope to like formally get this out somehow as a zenodo data set or something the idea was that maybe we could send these to the checklist publishers and say hey we think these are the missing names uh, what do you think and that's what we did with donald but it, it sort of came back, Donald sort of came back and be like, yeah, there's still a lot of noise in here. So I don't think I would necessarily use it as a way of like looking for missing names. It's my process is a little bit easier than going through hundreds of thousands of names. But maybe for the smaller groups, it still might be useful for people to have these like names that GBIF thinks is something that we need. So yes, they will become available. 
Another question from Javier Molina from uh, Advice of Living Australia. How often is the backbone updated? Is that an incremental update or is it a new backbone every time it is updated? Uh, let me see if I can answer that question. Uh, yeah, so you can see that the backbone updates are actually on this slide. So each of the dots are a backbone update. I don't remember, I don't want to speak for informatics, which are the ones that do the backbone update, but I think it's try at least yearly, but I think we're trying to do it at least every six months. It's like, but it's a very difficult process and it takes a long time. There's a lot of review that goes into it and there's a lot of processing that goes into it. So it tends to get delayed, but it's something that we're trying to do more regularly, basically. Okay, any questions from the audience? And if you've got questions, we have some time at the end as well. Um, we might be able to, if you put them into the Slack channel, we might be able to get to them later in the afternoon or the morning. Hello, uh, Elie Saliba, uh, Paris Museum. I wanted to ask you, so you checked for the old combination, but what about newer combination that haven't been added yet to, for example, Catalog of Life? Can this be also part of the problem? Yes, yes, of course. So the um, those would be the ones that would be the most embarrassing, or like maybe not the most embarrassing. The most embarrassing would be like an old name that has been around forever. That's an accepted name that we don't have. But those are sort of the second most problematic would be the ones where it would be a new name that's described. And that's what's happening. I at least know with Odonata that that's a lot of the names in there are actually just activity, new activity in the in the taxonomists are describing new species in that group. So that's a lot of the names are in there. Um, there was one publication I know where they published 60 new Odonata species in one publication. So that's, of course, not in the GBIF backbone yet. So yeah, so it's a mixture of both, of course, the old combinations and the new species. Yes, thank you. Um, we do have some more questions, but we don't have time at the moment. We'll try and put them into the Slack channel. And if uh, John might like to look at that sometime and see if he can answer those questions on Slack, or we might get to them at the end of the session. Next one's a video. The next uh, talk is a video from Yvonne Labras uh, from, is a scientific and technical coordinator of the French Biodiversity E Infrastructure. Um, there's lots more here, lots of acronyms. <laughs> I'll leave it to, uh, we'll just go on straight into the video if we may. Hi everyone, I'm Yvan Le Bras from French Museum of Natural History and PNDB, uh, French Data Hub e Infrastructure. And I am associated with uh, Julien Sananikon, Elie Arnaud, Olivier Norvez uh, from PNDB as well, and Sophie Pamerlon and Anne Sophie Archambault from the GBIF French Node. We we'll speak about how we can imagine going from raw data to data standard through quality assessment and semantic annotation. So speaking about raw data, we can showcase the fact that for the PNDB in France, we are working uh, as a node of the Data One uh, International uh, Network, who is promoting the use of open software and open source uh, software, sorry, and open uh, standards, like uh, notably the EML for Ecological Metadata Language Metadata Standards. So here we can see, for example, the French uh, PNDB uh, data catalog, uh, where you have access to data and metadata. And this is uh, based on the MetaCat uh, open source solution developed by uh, uh, NCES. Mm -hmm. So when you are on this catalog, you can click on, uh, on uh, a data set and have the details of the, the data sets, uh, the metadata associated to the data sets. And one interesting thing is you can have a metadata assessment report giving uh, a score of fairness of your data set, looking at uh, 51 uh, checks, uh, looking at metadata. So it is 
really interesting to look at this uh, this report uh, because it allows you to compare different uh, different data sets, for example, in terms of fairness, but also because it, it's a manner to propose the user to enhance and to ameliorate, uh, to enhance the fairness of its data set and to ameliorate the description of the data sets, giving uh, advice uh, uh, detailed uh, and organized uh, on uh, on three categories. So the, the 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 green one or the the the, the, the warning you can have if there is uh, uh, some uh, checks who are not uh, really good, uh, and uh, the failed one if you have really checks who are who are who are bad. Mm -hmm. So one interest uh, of this use of rich metadata through EML associated to raw data source is that with EML, we can describe, in fact, the attributes of the data. And describing the attribute is really amazing because on the catalog, for example, you can index the terms associated to the to the attributes on the files. So people can search by these terms uh, even if the, the raw data sets are uh, textual text files or uh, CSV files, for example, tabular files, or on a CDF or GIS or, uh, or other uh, raw data sets. And links to this uh, description of each attribute, you can also associate semantic annotation. And once again, it's just reusing the specification of the OML metadata, long, uh, metadata uh, specification. So here, for example, we see that for this uh, data sets on the metadata and for this particular data file, we have uh, a, a, an attribute to his name called uh, code observation. And in fact, we can add an annotation to link to a, a terminological resource here, for example, occurrence ID in Darwin Core. Mm -hmm. And this is, uh, this can be done thanks to the EML annotation module. So yeah, just uh, to show you concretely on the EML uh, file, uh, the XML EML file, uh, what uh, is the corresponding uh, part of this uh, annotation. So here we, we are at the attribute um, uh, uh, place. And in the attribute uh, place tag on the XML, you can have such an annotation tag uh, with the relation, the property uh, uh, of the, the annotation and the value here occurrence ID. So now we, we, we show that we can have raw data files, iterations raw data files. We can describe it in a detailed manner thanks to EML and even associated several things on this metadata uh, files and notably attribute names with uh, uh, an attribute name coming from, uh, for example, the data standards like uh, Darwin Core. So we are uh, shaping a way to, through uh, an, an ETL, for example, have a, a, a manner to automatically uh, create Darwin Core archive or a, a first version of a Darwin Core archive, uh, connecting it, for example, to a, an IPT. So we made a, a proof of concept last year uh, using a, a workflow engine a Galaxy uh, through the Galaxy platform to replace the ETL. And we have a workflow who can take, for example, the, the data set and the description in EML I showed you before uh, to uh, create uh, through this workflow at the end uh, an occurrence that takes the file who is compliant with the Darwin Core um, specification. Thank you for uh, uh, listening to me and don't hesitate to ask us questions about this, this work. Unfortunately, we got an email from Yvonne last night saying he couldn't be here. He had a family crisis or something. He had couldn't be here. So um, he is online. Oh. So if we do have some questions, um, it looks like Yvonne's online for us. We've got any 
Yeah, hello everyone. Really sorry to be to be late. <laughs> Anybody got a question from the audience? No, and we don't have. And we've got one online. A question from Andre Heugebert. What is the benefit compared to a standard Darwin core mapping? So the benefit is, is for now, if you have to make a classical Darwin core mapping, we have to do so using the IPT. And on the IPT, the major issue from now is that you can't share the raw data files, in fact. And the raw data file is not associated to metadata before going into the IPT. So the major point here is that we can benefit from just sharing the raw data, even if in Excel file, or NetCDF file, something like that, with detailed metadata in EML, which is also used by, by Darwin Core. So you have raw data and uh, ecological metadata language with semantic annotation on this EML metadata file. So after that, you can create and uh, facilitate the creation of Darwin Core archive. And you can have so both state of the data, the real raw data uh, files with detailed metadata, plus the Darwin Core archive with uh, something like the same cost than uh, just using the IPT for now. And one major big point here is that you have also a JSON LD version of your raw data plus metadata uh, you can uh, you can put on the the semantic web because you have uh, terminological resources directly on the metadata associated to the raw data. So there is several advantage, and we think in fact that making like this, we can really uh, propose something who is more efficient that than the actual process using the IPT and sharing raw data file plus the Darwin Core uh, version of the raw data files. Any other questions from the audience? We do have another one online that's popped in. A question from Sharif Islam. Uh, is, is there any relationship with EML annotation and W3C standard? Uh, it's not so easy to answer, but uh, what, can, what I can say is that, for example, there is a mapping between the ecological metadata language standard, metadata standard, and uh, schema.org. So we, we have something we can, we can use, in fact, the content of the metadata file uh, from an EML directly using w, W3C uh, standard protocols and things like that. Uh, for the particular point of uh, annotation, I am not sure there is a manner to exp express uh, for now the annotation on the who are on the metadata files using a W3C uh, approach standard or guidelines. I have to check it, but at least we have on these metadata files we have uh, the direct link, so you are I. Uh, pointing the relation and the term of the relation. So at least we use URI. So this is W3C compliant, if I am saying a mistake. So at least we can just pass or reuse the metadata file to, to, to use uh, directly the URI. If my English is not so, so, so bad, sorry, <laughs> too bad. Any more questions from the audience? No. Thank you, Ivan. It was good Thank to you. see you in person here. Yeah, have a nice day. Our next speaker, Sam, if you could come up and get the headphones on, et cetera. Uh, Sam Leaflang is a developer at the Disco Core Infrastructure. He works at Naturalis Biodiversity Center. 
and this is his first time at Tadwick, and it's good to see lots of first timers here. And while Sam's getting ready, if you're a first timer, go online to the tadwick.org, go into the community part of the website, see all the interest groups and task groups there, and get involved. It's good fun. Yeah, that's better. Um, yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, today I've been given the opportunity to share some ideas we're having within Disco, uh, within the Disco infrastructure, especially regarding uh, annotations and data quality flagging. Um, yeah, quick agenda. Um, we're doing a very quick overview of Disco. Most of you already know what Disco stands for, but just a quick summary. Then we'll look at uh, annotations within the Disco infrastructure. How do, you, do we define these annotations? A bit of overview to give a bit of context. And I want to do a demonstration, which I pre-recorded uh, last weekend. Uh, and we will go through an example um, of, the, um, of, the, uh, of a bit of, in, of the infrastructure. So DISCO, it stands for Distributed Sci uh, System of Scientific Collections. Just a quick summary of, of our goal is to digitally unify today's fragmented landscapes of European natural science collections, so really European-centered, into a single knowledge base uh, under common creation access policies and practices. Currently, we have about 170 national facilities involved in DISCO uh, and are active in 23 different countries. Yeah, important uh, note is that we're still in a, 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 a preparation phase, um, until, which ends this year. So uh, most of the work I will be showing are, uh, are in pilot phases. We are experimenting, trying things out, just seeing what will work and what won't work. This also means that there is still, um, uh, your, you, if you have ideas or, or remarks or additions, you can still come to us and we can quickly change it and see and test it out and try it. That's really the goal of this phase is just to try things out, to experiment, um, and then move on to construction phase uh, later, uh, where we actually will, will consolidate. So annotations. Um, yeah, within the infrastructure, we say an annotation is a piece of information attached to an object. And that's intentionally broad. It could be any object. It will often be a digital specimen or, or digital media item. Um, and the piece of information could be different types of information. We have distinguished at least a couple of them, and we're thinking about things like linking to information in other infrastructures, uh, things such as uh, comments on, on the piece of information on the object, um, data additions, but also error corrections, and things like data quality flagging. Um, for the annotations, we use an, an interpretation of the W3 web annotations data model. Uh, we had to make a few additions, changes to make it work for us, but the general setup is still, uh, uh, is still there, the general model, uh, which is the annotation. The annotation is a body, and the annotation points to a target. Uh, so the body is related to the, to the target. So, um, and within the annotations lifecycle, the idea is that uh, an object can have annotations, and at a certain moment, these annotations can be accepted by the community. This is a piece we're still heavily working on. It's still in development. And we're thinking about the kind of trust model where if there's general consensus about a certain annotations, these annotations uh, can become accepted and become part of the actual object itself. So that's a bit of the, the life cycle. Um, in this go, you probably heard it yesterday as well, uh, identifiers are essential. Uh, so each object will get a persistent identifier um, annotations, we see annotations as objects as well, so they also get this persistent identifier. Uh, and for more information, I would like to point to the talk that Sulen is giving this afternoon on the Zen and art of persistent identifier service developer for digital specimen. Okay, going on to the infrastructure. Um, in red are the things I will show in the demonstration. Um, but the general view is that on the left side here, we have the data sources, uh, which is often a CMS, so are simplified and generalized on all, all sides of this as well. But uh, generally, the information is in, in the collection management system. We have translators. We call them, they are involved in data retrieval, either uh, pushing or pulling data from the, from the source system. And important in the translator is the translation step where we try to harmonize the data 
Uh, the data could be in different data formats, uh, Darwin Core, ABCD, but also other local formats. And through a, a mapping, we try to harmonize the data into an open digital specimen uh, data specification. We have the processing service, which does some validation. Important is the PID minting, so we create a unique identifier. Uh, we do some storage. Um, there's part in there, which is currently still in development, uh, where we also um, calculate the MITs, the minimal information digital specimen. Um, talks on that are uh, by Elsbeth Hasten, I think currently in the other room. Um, and Matthias Dillon, who's also looking into how we can we calculate the uh, the mids level for a given specimen. Um, yeah, on the right side we have uh, published events. So when we created a new specimen in the system, when we ingest a new specimen, we also want to notify external systems. This could be the CMSs themselves, for example, to give back the persistent identifier back to the CMS. Could also be data aggregators where you notify them of a new uh, update or creation of a specimen in your system. And important are the um, automated annotation services where we um, uh, run automated annotation services over the ingested data. And um, I will show an example of this where we run a data quality flagging service um, over the ingested data. On the top, we have the PID resolution system where we um, resolve persistent identifiers um, an API there as well, and on the right side is the UCAS Unified Creation and Annotation Service, uh, which will be the front end uh, where the user injection takes place. So for the demonstration, we'll ingest a new digital specimen, just some test data, review the digital specimen and the persistent identifier we created. Um, we review the automatically created data quality annotations and add a new annotation as a user through our front end. So another disclaimer here, it's still an alpha state. We change it daily. It's an active development. Um, yeah, uh, the, the test set is test data. So it's really a couple of disclaimers here. And um, yeah, if we can now run the video and we move over to the demonstration part of the session. Yeah, there we are. So um, here's the digital specimen. It's just some, some test data. Um, I made it for this, for, for the TEDx session. Um, yeah, there are a couple of things in there, but most of the data is just Darwin core um, elements in here. Important is this piece on the bottom saying, well, for the enrichment, so for the automated annotation services, we want to run the digital specimen data quality annotation. So you could run multiple services here on top of your data, which, which will run after ingestion. Um, so incronously to the ingestion part itself. Um, yeah, we will put this into the system. There we go. Um, and then if the system has created now persistent identifier, the mids level, which we will calculate at a, at a later stage, it has a version. And this uh, PID is a resolvable identifier. So we can go online to the um, handle server, handle.net, and throw in our, our PID, and which will resolve to our sandbox.disco.tech or disco infrastructure, test disco infrastructure. Um, and all the information is there. And now we want to check if all the annotations have been generated. So we requested to check for data quality checks. And we see here that there are two annotations created, uh, both with a uh, persistent identifier and this one is saying, um, well, the, it's a quality flagging annotation uh, where the first one is saying, well, the event date is empty and it does com comply to the data quality uh, check, which we have seen earlier the work. And um, this says the license is empty. I only Im implemented a couple of them, um, not all of them yet, but just to give a bit of an example. So these are also persistent identifiers. We can go to these and um, yeah, just to run a quick overview of the annotation, it has an ID, a version, the type, and here we see the target, and the target links back to the digital specimen itself. That's, that's the target of the annotation. See, yeah. Um, so this is, uh, the license is empty. This is the uh, global identifier of the, uh, of the tech with data quality check. So we can review it here 
on the GitHub page, also shown before, uh, saying validation license is not empty. Um, yeah, it's compliant if the DC terms license is not empty, otherwise it's not compliant. So we looked for the DC terms license. So it's true, it's relatively easy to implement these as well. It's just a check on if the DC license term is there. If it's not, then we add an annotation to the uh, to the object. Um, yeah, it has the, uh, the PID for the creator as well, uh, which is still in development, so it's not an active PID yet. And for the generator of the annotations, which is also part of the uh, uh, W3 model, uh, which will also be a PID. Just to show that we're in active development, we have a bunch of APIs. They're not stable yet, so don't build anything on them, but we're working on them. We're creating... Uh, endpoints uh, uh, almost daily, uh, new functionality there, and uh, going to the front end, which is the place where users actually start to interact. We can see the front end here. It's also in development. We're testing things out, seeing how we can do things. We wanted some information on the minimal information for digital specimen emits. Um, and if we check, we can find here our created example, which was a test for, and uh, we see the specimen and the annotations that we created, that the annota automated annotation service created. Um, here's all the information we found there. Um, and also you can see on the pencil that the field has been annotated. So the license here has been annotation. Next, we can log in. We can authenticate ourselves through different ways. Um, I'm using the orchid to identica authentic authenticate myself um, as an authenticated user, I have more functionality there. I can also start adding annotations. So here I can save off for the license. Um, I can review the annotation. I can say add a new annotation. And for example, I say error correction because I know that the license should actually be a certain value. For example, the CCC zero. Um, and I can add a remark as well and say, well, I want to save this annotation as an error correcting. Um, and it's now also generated a persistent identifier for this, which is resolvable. And we can also update the annotations, which will create a new versions of the annotations. And we also keep all the versions as provenance and can also trigger, uh, send out events ex to external parties if we change anything here. So we see that's now version three. Um, next step is to see how we can get this accepted. Um, and that's the part we're still working on to see how we can actually get this community created, community accepted, and get the actual value that we do in error correction here into the digital specimen. And I believe that was my talk. Uh, I want to thank a couple of people, of course, um, um, my colleagues uh, at Naturalis and at Disco, but in particular Tom, Tom Dijkema, uh, who's been very active in developing the front end. Um, and of course, um, the disco work groups and the, da the data quality test groups within that week for their work on the data standards, uh, data tests. Thank you, Sam. That's, that's very interesting. And I might ask a question shortly myself. Okay, from the chat. There's, there's one comment, it says, Nice to see the Darwin core terms return with namespace specifiers. <laughs> Got a question from Deb over here. Hi, I'm curious if you separate the kind of thing you would expect a human to assert and make an annotation from the kind of assertions we're used to being made from an automated system, like all your lat lawns are flipped, here's a thousand records you need to change versus one record that's missing a license value. Do you separate those piles? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we're still looking into it. Uh, currently we said, well, uh, the annotation, it doesn't matter if it's coming from a machine or from a user, but you will have books of annotations coming from automated services. I mean, I, we now show data quality tests. We're also testing with an automated service which recognizes um, a plant organs, so stems and leaves from, and it generates, well, thousands or, yeah, of, of annotations. And if you have to go through those manually, that's not an option at all. So, yeah, it's it's definitely on, on our minds to, to think how we can make it 
so it's still usable and 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 distinct the the specific saying well this text and name might not be correct which could be in a user annotations coming from an expert and the bunch of of automated annotations which yeah so we are not there yet but it's definitely on top of our minds yeah i'm not sure that we're going to have much time for a lot of questions just one brief but uh note though are you aware that Padwick has an annotations interest group? I'm not sure that it's got a, a coordinator at the moment, but it's one that needs some people to do some work. And I'm glad to see you. And we're going to be talking a lot shortly. <laughs> Great to see work on this again. Um, as someone who sort of started this game about 20 years ago, um, and at the time, technology was really our problem, but also the social problems. And we won't get into the social problems here, but <laughs> the challenge of the time was trillions of triples. Uh, when we were looking at semantic annotation, we're still doing annotation here, relational versus graph. The problem is still massive. If you let the machines do work here, you're talking about a massive data store. Are you prepared? Is Disco prepared for that? Yeah, I think, um, well, one distinction is that we're uh, focusing on specimen data from the European collections. So we're not doing occurrences. In, in, and yeah, we'll have hundreds of millions annotations potentially, um, but, but I think it could be feasible. Yeah, we're still hoping that that also the, the capability of storing and then requesting those um, those annotations would be uh, would be doable. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, that these are also the things that we're constantly working on and testing. And we actually changed a couple of implementations because we weren't completely happy with them. And then, yeah. Thank you, Sam. There are a couple of extra questions that have come in, but we're going to have some time at the end, so we might come back to those at the end of the session if we may. <laughs> Thank you. Our next speaker is Francesca Jarosinska. Um, she's project manager for the Ennet Wild project at the French Biodiversity Agency a project funded by the European Food Safety Authority to collect and standardise comparable wildlife distribution and epidemiological data in Europe for disease risk assessment. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, Well, I am, um, as has been introduced, I'm Francesca Jarzinska, working at the French Biodiversity Agency, and I'm going to continue some of the interesting discussions that happened yesterday um, about nestedness in Darwin Core and um, also this story about material samples. And I'm going to talk about this in the context of an epidemiology case study. So how do we make um, disease um, risk estimations. Well, we need wildlife distribution data and we need wildlife disease data. And at the moment in Europe, we have, we have both, but they don't talk to each other. And that's a result of different standards in both of these fields. So the European Food and Safety Authority put together a consortium um, under the title of the Ennet Wild Project, um, where phase one was to basically create a data model for wildlife distribution data. Um, and that has now been done, and we also have um, a shiny application for this standardization process for data across Europe. And stage two now is to create um, a data model for the wildlife diseases. So the previous data model built on uh, the Darwin Core standard using the event core, the occurrence extension, and the measurements or facts extension. Um, and we're going to basically dive straight into an example of occurrence data for the wild boar, which we can model using the event core and the occurrence extension. Um, and the basis of record here for the um, occurrence of, a, of the host individual is a human observation. 
So what happens if these individuals were tested for the prevalence of African um, swine fever virus, which is currently an epidemic in Italy, for example? Well, then we're going to add two more columns to this data. Was a blood sample taken and was there um, disease presence? And so here, what we propose is to use nestedness then in the occurrence extension, where we have the human observation of the host individual, and then a material sample which is extracted, so the blood sample, um, which gives or doesn't give the, the presence of, um, of the virus or the pathogen. So if we see here, what we would create then is a nestedness in the occurrence extension where we would have a parent's occurrence ID, which relates the, the human observation to the material sample. Um, and then in the current status, giving an indication of the presence of the disease. So here we demonstrate the potential usage of having um, nestedness or a hierarchical structure in the occurrence extension. And what do we do then if we have further information on the laboratory analyses, for example? Well, then we can use the measurements for fact extension. Um, so, for example, if we have the host species which was observed at a particular point in time and a material sample was extracted, in this case a swab, um, which is identified for disease presence via laboratory analysis. In this case, it comes back negative. Um, and, but we can also use the, the extended features of the extension to give indications of the value, the units, the method that was used, who determined um, uh, the disease presence and when and so on. Um, what's interesting about using this hierarchical structure in the occurrence extension, though, is that we could have, for example, two host individuals that were observed and only one was, was sampled for a, a tracheal swab, for example, whereas both were, were swabbed um, with cloacal swabs. And then from there, we have um, laboratory analyses. Um, to capture the fact that there were two individuals in the second um, analysis, we could also say, we could also give an indication of the number of individuals that were pooled. But this leads on to another question, because that would relate to a previous measurement. So then that would indicate that we might need then also a nestedness in the measurements or facts extension. So we could have, for example, an analysis result, which could have an ID or um, an H antigen or an N antigen in this case. Um, the same can be said for statistical data, where you could have an estimate, for example, and then confidence intervals, which relate to the estimate. Um, so here we demonstrate then that having um, nestedness in the occurrence extension is potentially very useful, um, but also nestedness in the measurements or effects. Um, we see that in the occurrence extension, we can then map the host um, pathogen relationship but we can also map um, when multiple samples are taken from um, one individual or when partial host information is available. But similarly, that um, we can then create measurements of measurements or information on measurements in, by nesting in the, in the measurements or facts extension. And this would all then rely on the basis of record where we would have a difference between the human observation versus um, a material sample. Um, and we've put this, a, we've given this a, a, a test basically in certain databases in Europe, um, in this case for the common swine fever and African swine fever database, um, where we can actually effectively map using this nesting, um, the presence of disease in host individuals. Um, but is this actually the, the best solution? Um, what we've talked about so far is the occurrence extension and the event core and the measurements or fact extension. Um, but yesterday, we, there was also a lot of talk about the material sample extension, and we kind of played a bit with this idea as well. Um, for the moment, um, what we've shown is that using the basis of record and nesting in the occurrence, that we could link um, disease observation with the host individual. But what about if we actually use the material sample extension and had preparations related um, in the extension to an occurrence? And this would re require duplication of the scientific name, um, the organism scope, and the current status in the material sample. So I'm very curious about um, 
your opinions or feedback on, on these two different um, approaches. Um, because here then in this case, what we would have is we would introduce the, the a third table, which would be um, the material sample um, extension, and there would be nesting then in in both the occurrence extension, the material sample extension, and then in, in the measurement or fact extension. Um, so going forward, what we've demonstrated here is that nesting in each of these extensions um, could be useful for disease data, um, for epidemiology data. Um, and that we can then map the relationship between the host and the pathogen, um, but also about uh, measurements that were taken from, um, from measurements. Um, we still have this question about whether the material sample extension or using the basis of record um, material sample um, value is the, is the best scenario. Um, but in either case, this would allow better and preemptive um, action to, to dis potential disease transmission in Europe. And here I show a, a map of um, wild boar um, movement as a result of this, epi um, this epidemic in Italy for, for African swine fever. Um, and so it's basically just an example that having these two data types um, on the same standard, um, would be of great benefit then for the European Fa Food Safety Authority um, goals, primary goals. So thank you for listening. Do you have any questions or any feedback on the... I'm sure we're going to have lots of questions, Francesca. Uh, here's a question from... David Shorthouse, he says, a parent-child arrangement for occurrences is interesting, but is this the same as associated occurrences? And then go, and the note there, know that the resource relationship class is an alternative means of representing associations and with more detail. Yeah, well, the, um, so the resource, I'll start with the resource relationship question. That was, um, discussed in the previous data model for Enet Wild um, as a potential solution. Um, in the end, uh, the parent occurrence um, relationship was, was chosen because it's, it gives a, a more human readable uh, view of the relationship in the case, for example, when you have a group of individuals that are observed and only a few have an identification, for example. Um, and so to fit these two models together, this has been based on um, the parent occurrence um, example. Um, and I think it's quite, it's quite a powerful uh, tool potentially because it, for example, it can be used for partial information of, of, disease, uh, of, um, of group information, for example, but then also clearly a potential use for, for this host pathogen relationship. Um, I think it's, not entirely the same as an associated occurrence because it's um, the, the disease presence comes from a material sample. And I think that's really the question here, trying to disentangle um, whether the material sample basis of record is enough then to demonstrate this relationship or whether it should be coming from the material sample extension. Do we have any questions from the audience? We do have more online. Well, if one says, how can we test it? Thank you, Francesca. <laughs> um, how can we test it? Well, with, with uh, data, I think, um, by testing it on, on data sets. Um, and so far, I've, I've taken databases that are accessible for European data, um, for, for wildlife disease, um, and it seems to work um, using this um, nestedness in the occurrence extension. So I'm actually, I'm, I'm open for more data. It would be nice to, to test it further as well. Uh, 
Okay, and another one from Roger Hiam. The parent of properties are typed in their name, i.e. you can tell from the property name what it points to. I wonder why this is the chosen over just plain parent of or derived from properties, or even using Dublin Core source property, the definition of which fits your usage, I think. Oh, it's an interesting suggestion. It's one that I haven't explored. So um, yeah, that would be something that would be something to look at. We have time for another question if somebody has one from the audience. Thank you. Hello. Okay, the next speaker is Arthur. Arthur is a semi-retired environmental consultant and co-coordinator of the Tadwick Data Quality Interest Group. He's published many data quality and georeferencing documents for GBIF, some available in multiple languages. He now spends a lot of his time as a wildlife photographer and contributor to iNaturalist. This is his 18th Tadwick meeting, although this morning he was telling me that maybe it's his 19th, so who can beat that? Uh, thank you, Arthur. Thank you, Arnold. Talking about formula, formulaic names, we give things names so that we can communicate about them. In the biological world, we have a formal binomial name or naming system that Rod Page talked about the other day, and it has worked for nearly 300 years. It worked well and stood the test of time, but biodiversity is being lost at an alarming rate, and taxonomy can't keep up with the uh, nomenclature. So traditionally, formulaic names have been used to tag undescribed species in the form of eucalyptus, but one or and four, three, two, one, or something. But there's no standardization in the structure. Eucalyptus but one in one herbarium might not be the same as eucalyptus but one in, an, in another herbarium. There's no way to know. So formalized formulaic names have been used in Australia for more than four decades, mainly for plants, but more recently for freshwater fish. So how are they structured? So we have the genus, but some sort of qualifier and a voucher specimen. So the qualifier can be a locality or a character, part range or long lived, et cetera. And the voucher can be to a collector, a number, or more rarely a herbarium specimen ID. It can be intraspecific names as well as specific names. So here's some examples. Eucalyptus per esperance, ME French 1579, uh, Eremophilus per narrow leaves, JD star, et cetera. You've got a, um, a subspecies example, and they can later be synonymized. For example, Fultonaeus per Glenolan point has now been synonymized to Fultonaeus prosipa, prosipua, subspecies prosipua. So why do we need them? Well, a lot of these names refer to fairly rare taxa. They've only recently been discovered. They haven't been in the biological realm for many years, so they haven't got names, but we need the name to conserve them. This is a recovery plan for a threatened species. Luke Pogan spurt onger up, AS George 16682. This is a spelling mistake, but the recovery plan put that part in twice. And this is a recovery plan for this plant in Western Australia. Okay, the 
Federal Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act list of threatened flora as this species. So that's in legislation that this species is threatened and needs to be looked at. The Australian Plant Name Index has the species here listed. The Australian Plant Census uses the name. And then we get to the Atlas of Living Australia. And there it is, the name. You can search and get information on it, photographs, whatever, if they're available. And in Flora Base, the Western Australian um, system has it. But you'll notice here at the, at the bottom is more recently known as Styphelia disjuncta. So it has been synonymized. Some of the other databases haven't caught up with it yet. But it's treated the same. So it's in legislation, but the link can be to the new species. So we go and look at the taxonomic treatment by Hislop and went And you can see that this subspecies, that this um, formulaic name is a synonym, the same as any other name, synonym. And you can see that this specimen record, the voucher, is listed under the other specimens examined. It might not be the type, but it's synonymized in there. So uh, once it's got a new name, that name is linked to the old name that everybody has been catching information. But why worry? It's not a big issue, is it? Well, in Western Australia alone, in just that state, there are currently 987 currently accepted undescribed plant taxa out of an estimated flora of about 13,000 species. That's one thirteenth of the whole flora is undescribed taxa. And a lot of those are a threat. So what about the rest of the world? What about South America and Africa and Asia? What about other taxonomic groups, index, insects and fungi? There must be thousands and thousands, tens of thousands around the world that we know something about, but we don't have a name yet. And they may be threatened, so we need to be able to talk about them. We need to be able to collect data about them and put them into a database so that we can uh, learn something about them. Now, iNaturalist and other citizen science applications, iNaturalist takes its plant names from plants of the world on, online, both the Kew Gardens, and thus doesn't include any formularic names. We can only include the name at a genus level and add a note, like I've done here with this species I collected. Um, in Western Australia, this Darwinia. So all I can do is put in iNaturalist. Oh, my glasses there. Okay, thank you. So all I can do in iNaturalist is put it in as, whoops, get back. Is the genus Darwinia and put a note. This is an undescribed species known as Darwinia but Gibson Royce, and then links to Flora Base, the Atlas of Living Australia, Esperance Wildflower, Flowers, etc. So we've recently established an iNaturalist project where we can put undescribed Australian plants which they're calling phase name species in. And this was a few days after it started, we had 165 observations of 30 names uh, being put in by 25 species. So for example, I can tag it using the, this project. I added to the project, the undescribed Australian plants, phase name species and other identities. I can add a tag. And I can put this observation field. So now we can search in iNaturalist using that observation field. But we would really like to have iNaturalist in, be able to include formularic names. So we can add photos. We've got all these naturalists out there taking photos, which might be important taxonomically. It might be important for all sorts of purposes. 
but we can't, we put them in our naturalist and nobody can find them. We need to be able to find them. So we can filter on this field and pull them all out. So we only just started this. Australian freshwater fish, they're doing the same thing. They don't have a voucher. I think it's important we have a voucher. But the IUCN red data list is now accepting these formularic names for Australian freshwater fish. So they're being added to the red data list. And here's an example of this Melogopena Pena species running river. So there are other projects that are looked a bit at this, the Arctos on their tagging of names and identifiers allows for formulary strings, but it's free text. Scratch pads has entry of formulaic names, so it's very temper temporary, there's no formalization, and generally they're meant to be temporary. The so number of issues and options, some sort of standardization, whether we need a, a Padwig, a BIS standard, needs to be discussed. Perhaps a different standard for plants and animals because of the voucher issue. The animal people don't like the vouchers because of some of these taxonomic pirates in the world that rush out and publish these reptiles and other things in their own self published journals and cause a lot of headaches. I don't think by not putting a voucher into the system is the way to solve that issue. I think the zoologists need to solve it in some other way. That's just my view. We hope to publish a more comprehensive paper later. And anybody that wants to talk about this issue, please come and talk to us and we'd welcome feedback and issues. We'd like to acknowledge the many people who have made suggestions and discussions with this issue so far. And my two co-authors are at the University of New South Wales and they are very big users of iNaturalist. Thank you. So does anybody in the audience have a question? Thanks, Arthur. That was, that was amazing. It's Henry from Mesa, um, and a garden in Belgium. <laughs> Shelley and I were discussing this yesterday because I was mentioning a problem we have with herbarium specimens where scientists get excited about a group, they organize it in the herbarium, they write a provisional name on it, and then they never publish. We do mass digitization, the stuff all goes online, people see the name written on the specimen, and the name starts living a life of its own. And I think these names, like in shared specimens of the past, once they enter the literature, it starts creating headaches. So I think this is a nice way of maybe accommodating these sort of names temporarily, because I think otherwise we get to a situation where it just leads to a lot of confusion in the long run. What are your ideas on that? Thank you. I think it's it's important. We need to use these, we need to use names for these things because in taxonomy it might be 20, 30 years before it gets a taxonomic name. At the rate we're losing things, we'll have lost it by then. So we need to be able to put this stuff in legislation. And because we've been using it in Australia since the 1980s, and people are using it, they're putting those names as synonyms. It's generally accepted in the botanical world in Australia, and it works. It's in legislation, it's in the states are using the same name. And if there's two or three names in different states refer to the same thing, they're referring to a voucher. When the taxonomist comes along, they can look at that and say, oh, this is a synonym of that. And this one's the same thing. We can put it as synonyms. That's the way our taxonomy works. And I'm sure if Linnaeus was around today, he wouldn't be as restricted in the strict binomial system that he developed hundreds of years ago, because he was a progressive thinker. And I'm sure that he would be looking at other ways of doing some of this work but we are tied to the binomial system we're tied to taxonomy but with we don't have enough taxonomists to work so we've got to do something in the meantime and to me this is a way of doing it um a question from ian engelberg 
he says, what other terms are people using for this? Formulaic names, informal names, open nomenclature, and via barf answered, he said, formulaic names sounds nice. So, and a lot of places we're tending to use formulaic names in the botanical world in Australia and have been for a long time. I notice in the uh, iNaturalist, they're wanting to use phrase names. I prefer formulaic names. It is a formula that we're using to, to describe it. And if we come up with some sort of a, a standard, a standard way of doing it, it'd be nice. I don't think it's a difficult standard to develop. Um, we could use a term for them. And maybe we need a formulaic names task group under one of the taxonomic interest groups of Hadwig. In the names issue raised a lot of comments. Pod says verbatim identification sometimes. And in Ian says verbatim identification is broader than this, though. While Marcus says informal or phrase names, I've seen used a lot. Manuscript names sometimes, and I end response. Manuscript name is something different. So, a manuscript name is different. Um, it's treated the same way often, but um, it's formed as a taxonomic name temporarily before publication. Sometimes it gets dropped and it never sees the light of day. But I think whatever we use, um, if we can use something like this formulaic name, people know what it is. They know it's not a published name. It doesn't look like a binomial published name. And it's got a particular structure. And to me, having the voucher link is important. And um, having a way to deal with this, the same as we do with any other name, and the way we can put it into, uh, into the synonymy and the literature. Question up the back there from maybe the last question for Arthur, and then we'll go on with the discussion and the the, the, the other questions that didn't get answered. Thanks, Arthur. Very interesting. I didn't actually I didn't know about that formulaic standard, and I think well, you have a standard, or at least that's reasonable, right? But let's go back to the good old days, right? When plants were being named, what were they? They were a type. Right, there were a couple of collections, one of which became a type, and they were a few words that described this thing, like literally a few words, right? So that's how we started, and that is how we start, right? We don't have enough taxonomists, you're right, we're not going to get a monograph quickly. So it's a placeholder. To me, the problem is who's holding those names? Where, where do I go to get them? And you said, you know, the floor online, whatever. So we have to convince those people to say these are just as valuable as anything else, especially if they're tied to regs. I mean, that that's critical. So I think this is a very important point, but I, I like the evidence of the thing, right? We need something to refer to better than a picture. So it'd be nice if it was a collection, but I like the concept. Yeah, and we need Steve's backbone to start incorporating these formulaic names. We have them in the Australian Plant Name Index and they're there. We've got a lot of data in Australia under these names, but I think they get lost when they go to GBIF. So I'll just add a comment here that you just don't create a phrase name and it just appears. Um, the process in Australia is actually quite strict. So you actually have to provide evidence that you believe this is a new taxon and we have internal publishing and review mechanisms before these are created as well. So it's not just a, these things pop up like manuscript names. There's actually quite a bit of documentation as well. Two seconds on that. So what slows us down is the, it's the manuscript, it's the taxonomic publication, but what are we really talking about here as long as it's not a new, new thing like new genus, new family? We're talking about a few terms, maybe two or three terms that make that thing unique from the other things. So focus on that. What are the two or three things that we know that make this different, we think make it different from other things? If we just had that tied to that name, that's a huge step and it's not that hard. Yeah, and, and it's as we say, there's 970 odd in Western Australia alone that are being used and people are collecting data 
I recently did a trip through Western Australia and I think I photographed 14 of these taxa that didn't have names um, and we've put them into this system now and we can have it. And the taxonomists can use that. They're looking to do their publication and they're finding the distribution of them because they've got photographs and information as well as the data and they can go out to those locations and, and collect them or whatever before they do their manuscripts. Okay, so I think we're now into our 13 minutes of open discussion. So if you've got any questions to any of the authors, um, please bring them forward. Uh, if you've got anything you want to discuss, please discuss them. And we have some questions online. And um, if you want to, as I said before, if you want to get involved in any of this, it's us that create these standards. It's us that do the work. We're volunteers. We don't get a lot of money. We don't get, we're not a company or anything like that. We're a group of people that see a need and let's go and you know, do something about that need and go on to tadwig.org and look at the, the community and you'll find lots of interest groups and task groups, whether it's this one or, or data quality or whatever. Now we've got some online questions. This is for Tom uh, from Roger Hian. At the WFO backbone plan list, we run a script against GBIF so we can prioritize curating and placed names based on the number of current records in GBIF. Well, actually, it's not a question, it's a comment. Hey, John. Hey, John. I don't know if you want to comment on this or. Uh, yes, so um, I guess it was just a comment, but I will just talk about uh, using occurrences as a way of, I'm not sure what they do in this case, but just using occurrences as a way to sort of assign value to a name. So I I have done that, and of course, I have a list that's, you can just see, oh, this missing name has this many occurrences tied to it, and that's useful, but I, also, I tended to intentionally not do that because uh, that's kind of misleading in a way because if you, according to what Arthur was saying before, if you are interested in that very rare taxa that only has maybe one occurrence tied to it, that's still something very valuable um, it, within GBIF. And sometimes those things are some of the most valuable data rather than uh, 10 million seagull records or something like that. But uh, no, we love those too. But uh, sometimes these uh, records are name, missing names with small amount of occurrences are some of the most valuable data that GBIF has. So I'm not sure if that answers the question, but that's just a comment about assigning value based on number of occurrence records. Here's a question for Sam from David Shorthouse. Uh, he says, somewhat tongue in cheek, once atoms of specimen data emerge from a CMS into an annotation store where all the action is happening. Is there any reason to retain the relict CMS? And as follow-up, edits are still happening in the upstream CMS, right? Yeah, thanks, David. Um, yeah, it's partly true that um, when we have ingested the data um, and the disco becomes the main place for editing and annotating the data, um, then the record in the CMS might get derelict, but it's a long step still from where we currently are. Um, and there is some information that could be in this uh, in the CMS, which we are not really interested in as the digital specimen, which is, um, for example, where it's stored on which shelf it is living. Those are not attributes that we're interested in. So there might still be cost to have information in your, your CMS more on, on the preservation and, and the physical location of the specimen. Um, but for institutions that don't have a CMS yet, this could could be the place where you, you edit and, and annotate your specimen. Um, I think the second question, um, yeah, if there's changes in the CMS, we need to get them in, into the DISCO infrastructure as well. 
Um, and currently often the kind of harvesting, so you collect everything and then check it against what you're currently having um, is being used, but we are also looking into the possibility to have a more um, well, event is a difficult word because it's used in a lot of different contexts here, but um, get events from them. So when there is a newly created specimen in ECMS, a uh, deleted or updated specimen, that they send a notification to us um, with the new information or at least give a notification that a certain specimen has been up updated or created so that we can actually focus on that one and don't have to ingest um, yeah, millions of specimens from which maybe only one or two have been actually changed or have been newly created. So that's also part we're looking into. And actually last week we spoke with seven more CMS vendors um, to discuss this option as well. So that's the, the, that part. Still another one for you from Rukhaya. Any plans for UI support for bulk annotations? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, she also gives an example. I, I chatted already with her through Slack. And if you have any questions, put them in Slack. I will try to answer them as well. Um, yeah, so if you put, there might be a really good use case to say, well, I know uh, she gives an example of a collector. I know all these specimens are, are from this collector. And that's something we really should look into how you can easily get multiple annotations uh, from the user to uh, into disco uh, to uh, yeah to a file based upload or something where we can pull them all out and make them annotations give them persistent identifiers net into the system so yeah that's a good comment we will keep that in in mind yeah okay this one is for lee but i think arthur will answer it um from Stevan Marentes. We do not have a TI team that can implement the test easily. Will here be a, a pre-implementation test in any popular language that are ready to use? Um, we've thought about that uh, at this, this stage, no, uh, but we hope to have the tests in a, a fairly simplified format so that they can be implemented in different structures. As I said, a lot of people are using specify KEMU RAMs, and we hope to talk to them and get them to build it into their system so that everybody using those systems can use it. Other than that, it's um, really up to people to try and do it ourselves. We, we're just a, a few of us that can't go around and, and develop implementations. I'd have to talk to Paul Morris to see whether we're thinking about trying to do a simple one. I think we were thinking of putting it in one language, but I'm not sure. But the standard will, Hadwick standard, when we get it, should set that out and should lay out how you go about implementing it in whatever system you're using. Still another one for you. From uh, Yiming Gang. Thank you very much, very much for the hard work. One of the goals of OBIS data uh, quality project team is to align OBIS data quality with this work. We would like to get the conversation with OBIS to explore how we can approach this. Yes, we're very keen to get OBIS on board and quite a few of our tests we've taken OBIS into account and Abby's been looking at some of our tests from time to time, to time and, and making comments on the GitHub and I'd advise you to go to the GitHub and if you've got any questions on any test, put a quick comment in there and we can look at it. Um, some of the OBIS issues are not simple, uh, particularly with the geographic stuff, like we were saying with um, trying to do hierarchy in the geography was difficult on land, it's nearly impossible in the ocean. Um, but we're aware of those things. There are a lot of issues that overlap with OBIS and these standards can be added to, I think we said 98 tests that we've got. I think we've got about another 200, which we haven't got as core, but they're there in GitHub in the same format. They just haven't been looked at thoroughly. Somebody want to take those, work on them and develop the standard. Uh, develop the test, they're welcome. One of the things that we've tried to do 
is put all these tests in a very standard format. So if somebody wants to develop a new test, they can go ahead and do it in the same format and the same system, and it should be a lot easier to do than what we might have done otherwise if we don't have that. One comment to, to Sam, um, one of the parts that we're playing around with that we haven't done a lot with is the annotations. The, yes. And we've looked at W3C annotations and we did have an annotations interest group in Tadwick, um, but the coordinator left and we haven't had one for a while, but we've been trying to work with them. We gave a talk, which I could dig out for you if you're interested, at the spinach meeting in Denver a few years ago, where we talked about how we'd go about the annotations using the W3C annotations and uh, to try and make it simple and but how you do it and how you feed it back to people when there are problems. And the idea with the annotations was an annotation never disappears. You may make an annotation to an annotation and looking at what you did there was, was along those lines and I'm pleased to see that. So if you make an annotation to an annotation, you don't just send it to somebody and they say, oh no, I've we'll checked that and that's right, we'll delete that annotation because the next person that comes along finds that same supposed error and they have to go through the work again. But if, if the annotation says, the annotation to the annotation says, we've looked at this and it's a perfectly good record, there's no problem with it, then we, we can just pass it by. Okay, it's already coffee time almost. Maybe we can ask for, if there is one last question in the audience. Don't forget the photographs after lunch. Come back here. Come one thirty, was it? One thirty after lunch. Come back here for your photograph. We have some great Hadwig photos over the year. Make sure you get your face in this one. And I'd like to thank everybody, both online and here. And if you've got any questions to any of the speakers or generally have some issues you want to discuss, put them into the SYMO5 channel on the Slack and we'll endeavour to get to them. Might, be, might not be tomorrow, we're busy with other talks at the moment, but after this meeting, we'll get back to people uh, and make sure all those are answered. Thank you, everybody, and have coffee.